Yeah. Please, the group leaders. Okay, we are starting the, resuming the session again. And this time I will request, just a minute. no, no. <laughs> this time I will request the human right first, so that, yeah. Human rights, human rights first. I like that very much, thank you. Um, so we had an interesting discussion in our group and I think that we um, discussed mainly the um, difficulty to put human rights first into practice, really. We, uh, we, we discussed the difficulty of having clear laws and clear um, policy objectives and also good intentions often, and then the practice in terms of implementation often being very different. Um, we also discussed that in order to address that, what we probably need to do is bring more focus again to the, to the end user, really, to the patient who is trying to get uh, medical products online, to children and youth who are, as a matter of fact, the majority of users of the online space, um, who are not really, though yet, involved in deciding themselves how we should solve the balance between their protection and their participation. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we empower youth, we want to ensure that they understand what is at stake and how their own rights are going to be um, affected. And we want them to also be heard in parliaments and to be included in lawmaking and policy making approaches to see that they are better protected in the online space and that they participate in it actively. Uh, we came also to the situation, uh, what happens if we cannot really work with government structures, because the government structures that we have themselves um, are not in uh, compliant with human rights. Um, and here, um, we, this is an, a field where, of course, human rights have to act not through the rule of law, but as principles. We have to work in advocacy, in, in raising awareness with the actors that are important. We had an example from uh, uh, an organization that supports media actors in Syria to help work against hate speech against women in Syria. And they do a lot of raising of awareness and advocacy um, to promote that, uh, that purpose. And we finally, I think, concluded that in all of this, we need to, of course, work with platforms, uh, but we need to make sure that they understand that in situations where we have democratically elected governance, governments and we have law enforcement structures in place, they must simply oblige platforms, for instance, to cooperate with law enforcement when it comes to child sexual abuse online. They cannot just delete based on their terms of standards, and we understand that they want to delete, they, they want to work against um, hate speech. They want to work against child sexual abuse online. 
but it's not helped if they simply delete. They need to also cooperate with law enforcement because we need to have criminal processes afterwards. If content is just deleted, it will reappear on another site and the, the victim is not going to be identified and uh, protected. We, we are just seeing the, the situation continue. So we need better law enforcement uh, in such situations and we need to remind platforms of their um, responsibilities under international human rights principles also in countries where human rights uh, are not enforced through the rule of law. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Now I will request Alexander for the technology. I'm from security. You need security, okay. Uh, so we were lucky, now a group was two session organizers of, of three presenting in this room. Uh, um, I'm not sure that we identified all possible issues which have to be addressed, but some of them were uh, identified. One, um, one issue is understanding of uh, norms related to security and, uh, and cyberspace. Another one, if you're talking about uh, security and talking about of, uh, enforcement of law and um, inability uh, to avoid justice, uh, the issue is uh, criminal justice response to uh, cybersecurity incident, uh, including cooperation, uh, cooperation between countries and uh, institutions and uh, qualification of criminal, uh, qualification and skill of criminal investigators uh, in modern world. Uh, another one issue is uh, engaging uh, with platforms, not only with uh, huge global companies, but with also with uh, smaller platforms, including local ones. Uh, another issue uh, which uh, was stated by our academic colleagues uh, is their lack of uh, public policies uh, that's in, uh, that motivates and enforces implementation of modern uh, security technologies, which also leads to number of vulnerabilities staying in the internet and possibility for exploitation. So that's it's also closing to the norm. And uh, our colleagues from uh, IETF uh, said that another issue that the governmental people and state people does not understand what is implementable uh, on the internet. Uh, so in this case, the legislations may be completely different from, from uh, what is possible in the real world. Uh, and the last, maybe, but not the least, the identified issues is the uh, attempts to measure security or security compliance. So if we're trying to have a scientific approach, we need to understand how secure are we. Uh, talking to identified areas, uh, I think uh, that any areas uh, which allows communications between different stakeholder groups, maybe stakeholder groups is wrong, but the different uh, institutions like government, technological, uh, organizational uh, investigators are the best areas for addressing these issues. Thank you, Alexander. Now the very important item, ethics, and that too on the internet ethics, Amrita. Thank you. Um, so we were three of us. Um, we had uh, Vakas Hassan from ISOC Pakistan, but he has a wears another hat from the government. So we had a mix of both. And we have Itha Belong. I'm so sorry, I may have pronounced your name wrongly. And she's from Lesotho. So um, the expectation from IGF 2019 uh, for our group was a consolidated baseline of internet ethics that can be adopted by different states and communities. Uh, what we discussed was internet ethics is broad spectrum, which does not only involve individuals and society's online behavior, but also extends to governments and business. At the policy level, the wish list is a need for clearer definitions. For example, how do we define ethics? Um, are there any international standardized definitions? Uh, similarly, for fake news, misinformation, disinformation, etc. cetera. Um, and then um, have a, a need for localized definitions, uh, which are aligned to standard global definitions, else that creates a lot of gap between countries. But again, local sensitivities needs to be taken into consideration. 
Um, the policy development process which was being discussed in the group um, was that there is a need for inclusion and the inclusivity should be of all stakeholders irrespective of gender, age, and young people need to be involved because they are going to be the next internet users. Um, they are users, but they are the ones who would be bearing the brunt. And the process should not conclude by just making the process, but include monitoring mechanisms, um, having representation from the stakeholders who actually participate in, in uh, drafting the policy process. However, when the policies are implemented, there is a need to draw a line between the policy implementation and misuse of the same powers to block, block freedom of speech or human rights, which is kind of uh, seen happening globally. Um, then uh, what we discussed was the need for on online companies to pro proactively develop and share transparent public code of ethics. Um, sometimes it's so complicated, most internet users, especially from developing worlds, can't understand it. Um, and uh, lastly, incorporating online ethics uh, modules for different age groups and communities. For example, having um, you know them incorporated even at the educational level for, for children because uh, they are the ones who are abused most. So they need to know their rights and um, you know, how to be a safe and more matured digital citizen. So that's about it from our group. Thank you, Amrita. Now I will request uh, stability and resilience Thank you very much. So uh, we dived into two of the, the possible workshops. One uh, was the IPv6 Independence Day, uh, rest in peace IPv4, where we also had <laughs> the session lead uh, here. Uh, we discussed few few items, most of them uh, technical. So uh, one uh, one was uh, basically because of at the moment at least less peering uh, in v6 world means lower resilience because uh, if you look at how the how the network has developed. Uh, IPv6 has less, of course, less adoption, and at core, uh, there are less peerings and less interconnects, uh, than, a lot less than IPv4. So uh, the paths that each ISP or provider has uh, through the rest of the networks are much more limited than IPv4, which means uh, less resilience. Uh, lack of interoperability of uh, the two protocols, uh, although there are, pro there are mechanisms, but by by nature, there are, there are, you, IPv4 hosts cannot talk to IPv6 or vice versa, which uh, which means if people cannot get IPv4 and want to operate only only on IPv6, they they will use con lose connectivity to a large number of users at least today, and that has the potential of basically creating two islands. Uh, and then uh, finally, IPv4 uh, because because it's uh, basically there is no more. It's gaining value, and uh, that high cost can hinder entrance of new players or expansion of the existing ones. So that's another thing which uh, which can threat both stability and resilience. Then we also uh, discussed a bit about uh, the other session, which is DNS threats and opportunities. Again, uh, we, we had uh, actually very interesting discussions. One of them was the uh, merit of global use of DNS abuse as a bottleneck for many types of abuse. Because uh, if you look at DNS, uh, it is a centralized, by nature, uh, namespace is centralized because you have one root, as ICANN has uh, the motto, one word, one internet. You want to have one root, you don't want to have a fragmented uh, root namespace. But also the way DNS is designed technically, that that namespace is also distributed uh, take from a technical point of view also as a, as a tree with one root or 13 roots in that case but uh, the whole distribution is also centralized it does technically it doesn't need to be but that's how the dns protocol is designed and that has made dns an easy target for many for example law enforcement uh, as an easy bottleneck as soon as you see something you don't like you can easily find and because it's centralized you can go wherever you have access in the tree and then uh, take them down which has happened in many cases. But uh, the question here is, is that, uh, should that be, or is, is that merit is the right thing, doing that? Because if a hacker is uh, hacking the system, normally you don't cut their uh, electricity. And if you look at the domain name as a utility, which is required to use the internet as, as a basic right, then should you just attack and like disconnect uh, or basically take down the domain, uh, which would be similar to disconnecting water or electricity to someone you don't agree with. So that's, uh, that was one of the points uh, which would be nice to be discussed in that session. Uh, 
then uh, the, the DO, the, the DNS over HTTPS protocol, as well we discussed that a bit. Uh, the main challenge there is the change of control, which is, uh, uh, at the moment, it is there is a contractual relationship between, normally between the user and the service provider, either the mobile phone provider or DSL provider, which again normally reside in the same jurisdictions. Uh, and the control of who is the name uh, service provider, DNS provider, at the moment is with the service provider. So if there's a dispute, misuse of data or things like that, end user can basically, at least in theory, in the same jurisdiction, they can go and file a complaint uh, about their service provider. But uh, with the DO, this control is completely taken uh, from the service provider and is now into the application provider. So uh, someone's residing in India, if uh, their service provider is basically decided by uh, Mozilla, as a California-based organization. And if they have a dispute, uh, good luck with filing a complaint and then following a judicial process uh, from India to California, from a person to a, to a multi-million dollar organization. And Mozilla is one of the good ones, if, uh, if you want to put it. <laughs> so, but that, but that's, that, would be, that would be one of the challenges. And uh, yeah, and, and there, are, there are a few other, uh, we, we went also to other, other stuff like the, the importance of education and then the interaction with law enforcement and the balance between things like uh, technologies like encryption and, uh, and the freedom. Uh, so some of them are documented in, in the file, so I hope uh, they, get, they end up in the sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, the Peter, for the technology trade industry. Yes, thank you. Um, the, the topic was a bit challenging, also given that uh, we, we didn't have any, anybody who was going to attend the sessions. But we had an interesting discussion, and thanks to the small team. Um, I think it's basically two, two topics, uh, trying to ask these questions. What, what policy um, question would people like to see addressed during the week? And uh, one suggestion that came up was after some discussion around um, uh, information exchange for cybersecurity purposes, which is a bit out of scope for this, but that's what, what people are interested in, um, that it would be good to have a multi-stakeholder discussion involving technologists, policymakers, users, and so on and so forth, of course, about uh, tangible subjects around information gathering and sharing for cybersecurity, like discuss things in the detail as an example and then from there develop a, a general playbook, um, how to address concrete questions and uh, maybe have an, an outcome that could be an agreement or it could be uh, that different positions are recorded and then the various sides understand or external parties actually understand what the, um, what the different aspects or different positions regarding a, a one of the particular questions are. Uh, and because I've talked about concrete issues, when is this long-standing question, at least in Europe, that whether or not an IP address is personally identifiable information, and there's, of course, uh, we, uh, we can discuss that for ages, but um, in, 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 in this environment, uh, getting a stance on what the, what the different uh, positions are and get that on record um, in that environment with the pros and cons, and the consequences that might derive from that um, would be a helpful takeaway from, from such a uh, policy session. And the other one, and that's probably uh, well uh, within the scope of the technology and trade, is the topic of, of cloud resiliency, which definitely is today a policy issue. Um, we also talked about these, the, the whole um, aspects of um, data access to data localization, which we know there is uh, a separate track for. But um, from a resiliency perspective, it's a policy issue, and it, uh, the interesting question is, who is the uh, most, uh, uh, most applicable facilitator uh, or somebody who can, can stir up the discussion? Um, and we addressed that or talked about a bit of uh, the question of diversity in the cloud sphere versus concentration. Uh, that we see in the internet environment from the economic perspective. And of course, the, the concentration uh, right now is, is um, probably a risk for the resiliency because it shrinks diversity and getting a, a policy approach to that rather than a simply economical driven um, approach would be, would be a helpful takeaway for, for people in the team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter.
Now, the most important item is the safety. And, and Alara. Thank you. Um, well, I will um, uh, provide a, a brief overview. Since there are many overlapping issues with uh, the, uh, the other topics, um, I would like to highlight that um, the specific uh, perspective of, of internet safety is more related to human, individual uh, um, or personal um, safety when using the internet, uh, rather than focusing on, on systems. Um, and the threat is usually considered uh, more to uh, uh, criminal rather than political, uh, including things such as internet scams, cyber stalking, cyber bullying, online predations, and extortion. Uh, I, would, I, I would add hate speech as well today. Uh, mostly, not, not, this is not a taxative, uh, it's just to, to provide um, uh, an example of the, of the falsity of, of this uh, approach. However, um, I would like to highlight a few issues related to this agenda. One of them uh, is the need to rely, to rely on robust data to talk about these issues, because these issues are usually covered by press, and we need, uh, we need to, to um, introduce uh, reliable and robust data when talking about them. This is a need to balance, uh, because sometimes these issues are, um, are also more um, episodic, but we need to, to rely on more stable um, uh, source of data for, co for talking about them, reflecting about them, and, and fundamenting policy decisions uh, related to them. Uh, another thing uh, that is important is to bear in mind that risk does not equal harm, and these uh, this, this topics I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a lot from the perspective uh, from, from Global Kids Online, which uh, we, we always try to balance uh, the, the idea of risk with um, uh, coping mechanisms and mediation figures that will help uh, individuals cope with whatever harm they face. And uh, finally, um, they, need, they need to bear in mind always that we need to equilibrate protection with freedom of, of expression. Uh, especially when talking about vulnerable populations, that uh, not, not everything is about uh, protection measures, but also we have to guarantee the exercise of other rights, such as the right of expression. Um, uh, this, uh, these topics and, and, and perspectives will be covered uh, in the sub-theme by five workshops. I will briefly read the title of them for you to know. Uh, one of them is Kids Online, what we know and what can we do to keep them safe. Uh, we have another workshop uh, entitled How and Why to Involve Perspectives of Children Effectively. Fortunately, we have as, um, some workshops on, on focused on children this, this year. We have uh, a few of them. Um, internet, internet Detox, a fail-proof regime to end online sexism. Another workshop is tackling cyberbullying on children with digital literacy. And finally, solutions of, for law enforcement to access data across borders. And then we have a dynamic coalition on child online safety, how to balance children's right to play and to be protected. And an open forum uh, called online protection and underage users. So this is how uh, we, we are going to, to have the opportunities of discussing all these issues in, in this, um, in this for, forums and uh, dynamic coalitions and open forum. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Anna. While uh, the time is over and the next program is on, I will just thank you, everyone. But I can see that all these six groups are not separate. These are the integral part of the internet. And this is required. And they are gelling with each other. Thank you very much for your presence. And thank you very much, all the group leaders. Thank you.